All right, so we left off looking at endo and exothermic reactions. So we're seeing reactions and now we're actually looking at how the, the heat or the energy is gonna change with these. So with exothermic, we're gonna see energies being released in the, the form of heat. Um, whereas with the, the endothermic reactions, those are gonna be um, absorbing heat and that's why they're gonna feel cold to us. Um, and then with these reactions, we can actually represent them uh, in terms of the, the energy changes with these potential energy diagrams. Um, and then with them, we've got a couple different pieces that we can look at. Um, with the, the diagrams we're looking at on the, the bottom right here, you can ignore endothermic and exothermic for now. Um, but if you look at the, the rest of them, we've got similar pieces there in terms of R, T, S, and then P. Uh, and with it, we just kind of read these like we do the, the chemical reactions. So we look at the, the left-hand side, that's going to be where our reactants are, are located. So that's showing us the, the substances we're starting with. On the right-hand side where we have the, the P, that's showing the, the products. So the, the substances we're going to be creating with this reaction. And then in the middle, we've got TS, which may be a, a new concept. Uh, but as it says on the other side, that's just going to be the transition state. So with these reactions, we don't immediately go from reactant to product. It's usually kind of a, a multi-step process where we've got kind of intermediates. Um, and that's what we're representing with that, that transition state. So with um, certain classes, you may actually um, try to determine what those transition states are going to be so you can better understand how that reaction is progressing. Um, but with us, we're just going to focus on the, the energy changes. So we're not actually going to be too concerned with what the, the transition state um, actually looks like. Uh, but we just want to kind of think of it as a an intermediate, as a sort of a, a midpoint for this reaction. Um, and then with those pieces, we can also see that there's the, the delta H, so that triangle H. Um, what the, the H is going to represent is enthalpy, so it's going to be the, the heat content in this system. So we're going to be able to see um, how the, the, the heat is going to change within these reactions. If it increases, like we see with that first reaction, we're going to consider that endothermic because these reactions are showing or these diagrams are showing um, the potential energy throughout the, the reaction. So if we look um, at that first bullet point now, potential energy is in the, the y-axis. And then on the x-axis, we essentially have time. So it's showing us how we progress through the, the reaction. That's why we have just reactants on the left, just products on the right. But we have kind of the, the intermediate in the, the middle there. Um, so when we're looking at the delta H with the, the one on the left, the reason we're considering that to be endothermic is because the, the products are finishing at a higher energy than the, the reactants. So the system is absorbing energy. Whereas the, the exothermic one on the, the right-hand side, we see the reverse happening. So the products are finishing lower. So energy is actually leaving the system. And that's why we're gonna consider this an exothermic reaction. So if we, we were observing the, the reaction on the right, whatever that reaction would actually be, um, we would feel heat being uh, produced because the, the energy is leaving that system. Whereas the, the endothermic reaction, the first one on the left, um, that one would feel cold, would be the, the opposite because in that case, energy is going into the system. And since we're part of the surroundings, the, the surroundings is losing that energy. Um, and then with it, we can look at a, another one just to kind of get a better understanding of what we're um, kind of looking at in these cases. And I think the, the two sides, again, may, are the, the easiest to look at because on the left, we're just looking at the, the, the reactants. So A in this case is showing us the, the potential energy of those reactants. And remember from chapter six, uh, the, the, the potential energy is going to be related to the, the energy stored in chemical bonds. So the reason that we're going to see this change um, as we move throughout the, the diagram is because during the, the reaction, we're going to be breaking and forming new bonds. So we're going to see that potential energy is going to change during that process as well. Um, and then with the, the opposite side there, E, now we're just looking at the, the potential energy of these products. So in this case, we would be looking at an exothermic reaction because the, the products are finishing at a lower spot. So the, the system is losing energy overall. Um, but with the, the stuff in the middle, if we look at letter D first, change in energy or change in enthalpy, if we want to uh, be more precise, um, the delta sign, that triangle is always final minus initial. So with delta H, we'll see this formula on some of the, the later ones. We're going to see it's just the, the 
products minus the reactants in terms of their, their potential energy. Uh, it's just going to be the, the difference between the, the starting and the, the final spots on these diagrams. Um, whereas B and C, now it's looking at activation energy in both cases. Uh, the only difference with these is forward and reverse reaction. So with the, the reverse reaction, that's going to be something we actually look at more in the, the second half of this chapter where we're looking at equilibrium because we'll see some reactions are actually going to be able to go in both directions. Um, but with these potential di uh, potential energy diagrams, we can still look at that, that reverse reaction. And what we're going to be doing is just reading the, the, the diagram, as it would suggest, uh, backwards. We're just going to be looking at it in reverse. So with the, the reverse reaction, we would just switch what we consider to be the, the reactants and the products. Um, but with the, the activation energy, B and C, you can see it's dealing with that, that bump in the middle. This is going to be the, the additional amount of energy we need in order for a reaction to actually get going. Um, so if we can, if you can think back to the, the thermite video from the, the first uh, little section of this chapter, the, the reaction started because they put a sparkler in the, the flower pot. If they just mix the aluminum powder and the, the iron three oxide powder together, a reaction wouldn't occur because it didn't have enough energy to get over this activation energy, to get over this energy barrier. Um, and that's why they had to add the, the sparkler to give it that extra little boost, get the, the reaction actually going in that case. Um, and we'll see how we can actually sort of calculate what the, the activation energy is. Um, so like I said, it's going to be the, the energy needed to activate the, the reaction. So it's going to be the energy needed to get the, the reaction going. Um, and if we're looking to, to calculate the activation energy, using one of these potential energy diagrams. On the, the y-axis, we'll actually have values there. So this one's just a generic kind of blank one, but we would actually have numbers. Um, and what we're going to be looking at for the, the activation energy is the, the top point from that bump. So that bump is representing the, the energy barrier we need to overcome. So we need to get to the, the top of that barrier, but we're not starting at zero. The reactants already have some amount of potential energy. So it's just going to be the difference between where we need to get to and where we're starting. So that's why when we look at the, the activation energy, we have this as our equation. Again, we need to get to that top point, but we're not starting at zero. We're starting with some amount of potential energy. So it's just going to be the difference between those two. And then with the, the reverse reaction, it's going to be the same idea. We still have to get to the, the top point. It's just with the, the reverse reaction. Now we're reading the, the graph backwards, so we would just con we would switch what we consider the, the reactants and the products. Um, so for the, the forward reaction, we would have the, the top point minus the, the reactants there. But if we were looking at the, the reverse reaction, we would have the, the top point minus the, the other side, because in this case, we're going in the opposite direction. Um, and then, like I said, on the, the previous slide, delta H, the change in enthalpy, the change in the, the heat content of the, the system, um, is just going to be the, the change in the, the products, or not the change in the products, it's going to be the, the enthalpy of the products minus the, the enthalpy of the, the reaction. So just that change in energy between where we uh, finished the, the reaction and where we started it. Um, and again, with the, the delta H, we can also look at it in terms of the, the reverse reaction. In that case, though, we would just have to switch the, the sign on delta H because we're just flipping what we're considering the, the products and the reactants. Um, and... With these, when we're looking at the, the delta H, if it's an exothermic reaction, delta H is gonna be negative because if we're looking at uh, an example like we have here, yeah, delta H is products minus reactants. So in this case, since the products is lower, we can make up any numbers we want for this. But if we just have 10, oops, it's supposed to be 20, but it kind of got cut off there. Um, but if we just have 10 and 20 for those dotted lines, in this case, we would have 10 minus 20, so we're going to wind up with a delta H of negative 10. Um, and that's why it's going to be an exothermic reaction, because in this case, the, the system is losing that energy. That's why we're finished, or the system is finishing at a, a lower spot, uh, because that energy is being released. It's exiting the, the system, going to the surroundings. That's why it would feel warm to, to us. But with the, the endothermic reactions, we see just the opposite. So again, if we want to make up numbers, we could have 20 and 10 again. But in this case, since we're finishing at 20, we would have 20 minus 10. So we're going to wind up with a positive delta H with these endothermic reactions. And again, that's going to be because of the, the energy we're representing with these diagrams is the, the energy of the system. So if the products are finishing at a higher spot than the, the reactants, that means they had to absorb energy 
um, throughout the, the reaction. And then since the, the system is absorbing that energy, we're part of the surroundings. Again, these endothermic reactions would feel cold to us. So if we want to see an example with actual um, numbers on the, the y-axis here, and again, the, the x-axis is progress through the, the reaction. Some of them call it the, the reaction coordinate, reaction progress, um, but it's essentially just showing us how far through that, that reaction we've gone. So with this one, if we want the, the delta H, again, it's going to be products minus reactants. So we're going to wind up with negative 20. And with this, if you are ever unsure which one's supposed to go first, so products or reactants, what you can do is just look to see what the, the difference between those two are. So just look to see 20 and 40. So it's going to be a difference of 20. And then in terms of the, the sign, if it's finishing at a lower spot like we are here, that means energy is being lost. So that's why we have the, the negative sign. But if we reversed it, if we finish at a higher spot, that means energy is going in, energy is being absorbed. So we would have the, the positive number there. Um, and with these delta H values, the, the forward and the reverse reaction is based on what I, I just said. They're always going to be the same number. The only thing that's going to be different is the, the sign here. So if we have the, the act, or we have the delta H for the, the forward reaction already, negative 20 kilojoules. That's why it's exothermic. If we want to get the, the uh, act, uh, delta H for the, the reverse reaction, we don't need to do any math. All we have to do is change that negative sign to a positive because the only thing we're changing with this delta H is what we consider the reactants, what we consider the products. So we're just switching them. And that's why we're able to just change the, the sign as well. Um, but like I said, the, the activation energy is going to be the, the energy barrier we need to overcome in order for the, the reaction to proceed. Um, so that's why when we're looking to calculate the activation energy, we're going to be looking at the, the top of whatever that bump is. That's going to be our, our energy barrier, essentially. Um, that's going to be the, the point we need to get to. But the, the reactants themselves have some amount of potential energy. So we don't have to go from zero to the, the top of that point. It's just going to be the difference between where we're starting and where we need to get to. Um, and the, the way I like to think about it is taking a rock and pushing it over a hill. Once we take that rock and once we get it to that spot, we're going to be able to just have it roll down the other side, have this rea uh, have the, the rock wind up at spot B. We're going to see the same thing with these chemical reactions. Once we can get the, the reactants to the top of that activation energy, once they get to the um, other side of that barrier, that's going to be where we see the, the reaction just start to proceed, and we're going to see those reactants get converted into products. Um, but just like if we're pushing this rock and we only get to, let me change the, the color here, if we only get to, to that spot, the rock would then roll back down the, the other side. Um, we're going to see the same thing with these chemical reactions. We need to overcome that barrier in order for the, the reaction to take place. And if we don't, we're just not going to see any reaction actually going. Um, but just like with this uh, this rock and hill example, we need to get to the we need to get the rock to where I put that that red X. But we don't have to push it all the way from sea level or the the bottom whatever you want to consider it. We're already starting at some, some height up here. Same thing with these reactions. We're not starting at zero. We're already starting with some potential energy. So that's why we just need to get that extra little bit for the, the activation energy. Um, and if we look at the, the previous example, the, the activation energy in this case would wind up being 60 kilojoules because we need to get to 100 in order for the, the reaction to start. But we're starting at 40. So we just need to make up that difference. We just need to get that extra 60 in order for the, the reaction to go. And then if we look at the uh, next one here, it's going to be the, the same idea. In this case, we need to get to 700. But we're not starting at zero. We're starting at 450. So it's just going to be the, the difference between those two. It's just going to be 250 kilojoules. And then like I mentioned, the delta H can be positive or negative, and depending on which direction we're going, we're just going to change the sign. With these activation energies, though, whether it's the forward or the reverse reaction, we're always going to see that the, the activation energy is going to be positive, because even if we look at the, the reverse reaction in this case, we still need to get to the top of that bump, so we still need to get to 700. It's just if we're looking at the, the reverse reaction, now we start to read it backwards, 
So instead of starting at 450, now we would start at 350. But it's still extra energy we need. It's just in this case, we would need 350 kilojoules rather than the, the 250 like we do for the, the forward reaction. So we just need a little extra energy in this case because we're starting at a slightly lower spot. But in either direction, the activation energy is going to be positive. If we go back uh, one more and look at the, the, the previous example again, again, we've got a 60 kilojoule activation energy for the forward reaction. But with the, the reverse reaction, now we're starting at a slightly lower spot. We're starting at 20, still need to get to 100. So with the, the reverse reaction, we would have an activation energy of 80 kilojoules. And with it, like I've been saying, the, the activation energy is essentially an energy barrier that we need to overcome in order for the reaction to start. Um, but with it, we, we want to kind of think about how does this occur? So we've got the, the reactants with some amount of potential energy. We need to get them over that, that hump in order for the, the reaction to start. How do we do it? Um, and with it, that's going to be what we kind of start to look at with the, the next piece of this chapter. We're going to start to see how we can get a reaction going and as well as um, how can we speed up or slow down a reaction. Um, but a lot of the times what we're going to see is that adding heat, increasing the, the temperature, giving that little extra uh, boost to energy, that's going to be the typically the, the most efficient way um, in order for this to occur. Um, and if we think back to the, the thermite video again, that's why they added the, the sparkler in the, the flower pot they needed to get the, the reaction actually going. So they provided that extra heat in order for the, the activation energy to be um, surpassed. <clears throat> 